Hello friends, welcome to Coding Garden with CJ. Welcome to a chill stream, a Q&A session, uh, an AMA session, where we're just going to hang out. Uh, you can ask questions, I can attempt to answer those questions, and we'll just have a good time. Welcome everyone to the show. Um, <laughs> so the way this is going to work, and the way this works, is um, if you type exclamation mark Vox in the chat, you'll get a link to this website. And on that website, you can see the commands that you can run in the chat. Um, so if you type exclamation mark ask, followed by your question in the chat, your question will appear here. Um, and if you have ideas, you can submit them with idea. If you have submissions, we're not really going to use the submissions tab today, at least right now, right now. Exclamation mark box in the chat. <laughs> uh, and also you can vote on questions. So if you see a question that you like, you can do exclamation mark upvote followed by the number that you see on the left here. Um, and these questions are ordered um, oldest to newest. Uh, subscribers come first. VIPs and mods come first. And uh, then we take into account the number of votes. And right now, like this question has three votes on it. Um, one thing you'll also see is right now, the majority of the questions are gray. And uh, what I updated was you will need to type exclamation mark here in the chat if you want your question to appear purple. Um, that will last for five minutes, right? And so for five minutes, your question will be purple. And then when we're finished um, answering a specific question, um, you'll probably want to type exclamation mark here again. There's no need to spam exclamation mark here. Really, the main time to do it is when I'm choosing a question. Um, and that really just helps me only answer the questions for the people that are actually here. Votes should go before mod VIP substatus because it's the voice of the people. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was last time that we changed it so that um, the mods and VIPs come first. But I, I always, um, I always uh, what do you call it? scroll around and I make sure to try and answer questions uh, for people that aren't subscribers, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll remove this one. So this question um, was answered by Andrew and I'm sure, I mean, this was a week ago that you asked this, but if you do have a comment for a question, you can add that exclamation mark comment followed by the question number. It'll appear right below that, uh, that question. Um, yeah. So let's say hi to everyone before, before we get into it. Um, uh, if you say hi, hello, morning, afternoon, um, or chill, that's today's theme. Say any of those things and, um, it will appear here and I will acknowledge you. So hello, Alka, welcome to the stream. What's up gaming diamond and funny dude and, uh, irradiated unicorn. Thanks for being here and razor one. What's up the big bro and P10 designs and smiley and Ilana. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, and David, hello, hello, and the she boss, and Monoloito, and Murdoch, how's it going? Uh, Not Blue Beast, and Honorable Tones, what's up? And Drills, welcome, welcome. What's up, Om the Turtle, and Mark Python, hello, Mark, and Dad of Dom. <laughs> yeah, you did submit something. I might answer that one first because it's easy. Uh, and what's up, Jonesy, and uh, P.S. Panasar, welcome, welcome. Yes, this is the second stream of the day. Uh, hello, Shines Love. <laughs> And hello, Jordan the Coder. How's it going? Um, and what's up, uh, Gaming Diamond and Honorable Tones, Chillax, and Andrew, and Leem, and Funny Dude, and Smiley. <laughs> Time to chill. <laughs> what's up, Toasted Jesus? And Doc. How's it going, Doc? Uh, and Dixon, and Chase, and Terrazoid. Welcome back, uh, the big bro. Nice to see you. You probably watch me on YouTube, maybe? Um, but I'm on Twitch now. <laughs> hello, Luis. Dad of Dom, how's it going? And uh, Mr. Wiseal and Goro, chill. And hello, MV, welcome everyone. Um, oh, is that the slow CJ clap? <laughs> is that what that is? That's awesome. Uh, oh yeah, so for uh, anybody that's new here, let's talk about how, how things work around here. Oh, oh, in the submissions tab. Oh, okay, what did, what did you submit? Caught a speed run. Yeah, so um, actually I'll, I'll, put the, I'll put this out there for you all to think about. I sort of need YouTube content. <laughs> so if at any time you have an idea for something that we can do during the live stream that can be easily edited out and uploaded to YouTube as a YouTube video, uh, feel free to submit, submit that as an idea. Um, yeah, we need content basically. <laughs> 
<laughs> disappointed slow clap. Um, okay, so uh, if you're new here, for one thing, there's the drop game. The drop game is fun. If you do exclamation mark drop followed by me, uh, that will um, drop your avatar. And if it lands, oh, it might land. No, it's just a little off. But if it lands, you'll grow a seedling here in the coding garden. Um, and uh, there's a 90 second timeout. Oh, close one. Yeah, it's a tiny, tiny little drop, but you can drop once every 90 seconds. Uh, you can also drop emotes. Nice drop, Andrew. That, that's a good one. It's not dead center, but that was a good one. <laughs> um, and yeah, so there's a 90 second type out, timeout. You can drop emotes, you can drop emojis, and you can drop your own avatar. Um, what else? Oh yes, the chat over here. So you see that some users in my chat have a country flag and like a team badge next to them. Hello, C Smiley, welcome back. <laughs> um, that information is here. So uh, if you type exclamation mark country followed by the two character country code for where you live, it'll put a flag next to your name in my chat. Um, and then the other thing is if you type exclamation mark team, uh, you can choose one of the many font awesome brands and that will make a badge appear next to your name as well. Um, yeah, and I, I removed the drop score scoreboard mainly because it was kind of in the way. Why do I have a seven second delay? I don't know, Andrew. Maybe I'm, I have my stream has less priority. No idea. <laughs> no idea. Um, oh, and we have a new thing. We have a new thing. So you can see that right now, uh, Andrew has the words uh, "gonna give you up" below his his chat his card, uh, and Andrew uh, sorry Alka has uh, "Viva la Revolution." Uh, so to do that, you can now do exclamation mark. So I, and I changed the command for those of you that were running it earlier. It's set status like that. And if you do that, you'll now get some nice text next below. Set exclamation mark set status followed by your status, and it'll show up in the chat card. Uh, you can also do exclamation mark clear status, and that will remove your status. Um. Um. Set status. Set status is what you want. <laughs> yes, set status. Like that. Um, can you send a message, Jordan? I'm curious if emojis work. Emojis should work. It should work. Oh, big, big, big. Oh, there's no there's no HTML rendering there. <laughs> Hakuna, <you're, laughs> Hakuna Matata. <laughs> Welcome, princess. Welcome to the show. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, look at that emoji. It's an italic emoji. That's pretty cool. Cool. So there's that um, cluttering 3D space. <laughs> Sad. Oh, no, Mel and I. Hopefully we can uh, we can get you feeling a little bit better. Well, thank you, uh, Dixon. 404 not found. <laughs> you all are silly. All right. Um, oh, nice. A white flag with a rainbow. Is that supposed to be a rainbow flag? I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Like pride, pride flag for sure. Okay. <laughs> and we're going to go ahead and get right into it. So I will say right now, if you have asked a question, uh, oh yeah. And then the, the other thing, we kind of mentioned it already, but to ask questions, all of that information is here. That's everything you need to know to ask questions. Now, if you, ha if you have already asked a question, type exclamation mark here so we can be sure that your messages are towards the top. And you're, vo you're welcome, Gubra. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for that follow, uh, Zadili. Um, so type exclamation mark here. Uh, if you've asked a question, and it will bubble up. Cool, 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 cool. I'll give everybody a few seconds, and then we will um, pick one. And I'll go ahead and answer this. So uh, the reason some of them are gray and some of them are purple are that uh, if you have not typed exclamation mark here within the last five minutes, it turns gray. So that way I'm only answering questions for people that are actually here. So thank you, David, for that question. Um, all right, back to the top. We have a question from Asalera who says, regarding microservice architecture, is the front end supposed to know all the back end endpoints or is it better to have an internal API gateway to redirect front end requ requests? Now, I will say, I haven't really built anything that uses a microservice architecture. Um, it has its uses. <laughs> I know a lot of people do it, uh, but I will say in any of the microservices that I have encountered, they are using something um, that is an API gateway. And hello, Sophia, welcome to the show. Hello, Cheyenne. Um, and I guess just to talk about this, let's, uh, let's make a little diagram. Oh, there may not be emoji support here. I don't know, or emote support. support. <laughs> 
Um, what are we gonna do? I think I don't think I can create a new document. I think we're gonna update this existing document. All of this goes away. Cool. So um, just to talk about like what microservices are really quick, um, you might have this idea of uh, multiple backend services. Um, so you might have like the users service. And then you might have the messages service. All of this goes away. <laughs> um, what else? And actually, can we increase that font size? Let's go up, 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 up. Cool. Uh, you might also have, I don't know, the auth service. Oh, oh. <laughs> you're talking about the stuff that I do. That's a different, that's a different entity relationship diagram. Um, yeah, welcome. Thanks for being here. Okay, so uh, the idea of microservices are that you take potentially all the different things that were like endpoints inside of your API, and you actually host them as separate services. Um, so instead of having one monolith, which is, I guess, the the opposite of a uh, of microservices, but having one monolith, it's basically like one Express API that has uh, endpoints for users, endpoints for managing messages, endpoints for uh, logging in users, different things like that. So instead of defining all of these within the same Express app, you would define each of these as their own individual microservice. Um, and then um, you still have a front end, right? And actually, let's let's delete this. Front end client. <clears throat> and <laughs> people that actually like the inventory app. <laughs> so you have your, your front end client, whether this is a mobile app or a front end app or something like that. And uh, if this were all just one API, right, it, this would just make a request to directly to the API, and the API could handle if it was the slash users endpoint or slash messages endpoint. So what we're talking about here is. Um, do we need an API gateway? And typically, the API way gateway does what um, typically what it does is it sits in front of these microservices. Let's call this the gateway. So it sits in front of these microservices so that your front end client only has to make its requests here, and then the gateway uh, can decide. Oh, well, that request was intended for users, so that goes there, and then this request was intended for. Um, we'll get there. This request was intended for auth, so it will go there. And this request was intended for messages. Um, <laughs> there's a lot going on in the chat. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Um, cool. So that, that's that's basically the architecture that we're talking about here. And I, I would say this is the most common way that I've seen it set up. But like I mentioned, I haven't done really any big apps this way. I've only helped other people that have done this. So, um, But yeah, this makes a lot of sense because these microservices um, it would be very cumbersome to have your client need uh, have to have your client reach out to each one of these microservices individually. So typically, what you do is you set up a gateway that behaves like it's one API to the outside world. It's one one URL, one endpoint, and then any request automatically gets routed to the right microservice. Um, yeah. So my answer to this is um, that's that's the way most people do it. You technically don't have to do this. You could write a client library that calls all these microservices, but then you're mixing like routing and microservice logic within your client. And you don't want that. So yeah, gateways are the, are the way people handle that. And ODXS has a, a pretty good answer. So short answer is yes. It's better to abstract your services in such a way where all requests coming from your front end hit a gateway layer. Uh, and this can be done as a, a middleman. Uh, <laughs> or you could couple your front end app with something like Next. Yeah, so um, that's the answer. Hopefully that helped you out, Acelera. Uh, and I'll say anybody that has questions or comments or chats, this is the best way to get them in front of my eyes because there's a lot of people and a lot of messages happening in the chat. So if you do exclamation mark ask followed by your question, it'll appear here and then uh, we can uh, address it uh, based on, um, uh, what do you call it? Popularity based on votes, time, all that good stuff. <laughs> yeah, you're working. Welcome, Asselaire. And um, for anybody else, you you learn you might have learned a little bit about microservices and API gateways. So there's that. All right, Dad of Dom asks, "What did I have for breakfast? Actually, today, I didn't eat anything for breakfast. 
Um, yesterday I cooked uh, chorizo and egg, and that was great. <laughs> I had that yesterday. Today didn't eat breakfast. I ate lunch at around twelve thirty, and I had chipotle today, which was really good. Honestly, I, I ate too fast and I ate too much though. I should have slowed down. <laughs> Thank you for that question. All right, uh, if if you have asked a question on this site, be sure to type exclamation mark here right now, and that way we'll make sure that we're only answering questions for people that are here. And hello, Yin Yang Gaming. Welcome to the show. Status seems to be broken. Reference error. Status is not defined. Hey. Hey, Katoli. <laughs> uh, and hello, Econ. Welcome to the show. Nice status. Yeah, good job. <laughs> I'll, I'll potentially review ideas. I think ideas are, are good for, like, if we're looking for something to implement. I don't know if we're... I'm going to try to answer as many questions as possible because there are 93 on here right now. Yeah. Object, object. <laughs> uh, do we exclamation mark idea our YouTube content ideas? Yes. I would say do that. My sleeping pattern is wrecked. Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, yeah, I just came back. I, I, I took a break, and now I've been live for about 20 minutes. Yeah, we got a zero. It's going to be impossible, but we're going to try our best to zero, zero inbox this box website. <laughs> Your question is great because you um, have not typed exclamation mark here in the past five minutes. So I'll, I'll go ahead and let, let everyone type exclamation mark here if you are here. And then we're going to answer a question. Lock it so it can't have any more questions? I could. But I mean, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to have more questions. <laughs> Clap as a badge. Yeah, we could do like emote badges. That would be cool. Well, the, the point is I will have you type exclamation mark here uh, every whenever I start to answer a question. That's the point. Because you could be lurking, but then maybe you're lurking and then you disappear. Uh, I can delete this question. OK, I will. <laughs> all right, let's answer Proxins, who says, uh, should we write tests for all components? I don't know which components I should write a test for. Uh, and I'm guessing you're, you're talking about front-end testing. Are you talking about uh, React or Vue? Uh, I mean, the answer is the same for either. Um, but really, I try to take a pragmatic approach to testing. And, and so you're doing it with React, yeah. I, I would say test um, the, the smart components. So components that just take in props. I never finished the focus mode this morning. Oh, the bot would have been restarted, though. <laughs> we'll do uh, three more minutes of focus. How about that? Um, but I would say, so let's say you have uh, like functional components, and those functional components take in props and then just render something. I would say, in a pragmatic approach, do not waste your time testing those components, because uh, those components are just rendering information that's passed into them. Um, now, you can test that. If you pass a function in, that function is called if the component is interacted with. But, I, but I, I would basically start there. If you have a component that doesn't really have any logic in it, it's just like a component that renders something, I don't see a point in testing that component other than having 100% test coverage. Uh, the main reason being is because at that point, you're actually just testing like the React framework itself. Like You're testing if props and render functions work in React. <laughs> So I would say, like, if if it's a it's if it's a simple component component, avoid it. Really, the things that you want to test are things that have interaction. Um, so if you, like I mentioned earlier, if you pass a function into a component, and you want to test to make sure that that function is called in a specific scenario, definitely test for that. Um, and I guess the other thing as well is like if you're using React and Redux. If your component does nothing but take data from the store and render it, I also think it's a waste of time to render to test that component. You should be testing the store directly. You should be testing when a certain action gets called, does it update the store in the right way? Yeah, and, uh, and Datadom has a great point. You can have snapshot tests to know if the UI changes. And so uh, snapshots are really good for those exact scenarios where you know that the component is always going to render in a certain way. So there's no point in writing very specific code that says, make sure this H1 says hello. Um, but instead, you are just saying, uh, you, in jest, you can say, uh, make sure, uh, expect match matches snapshot. And that'll actually test for the UI. Uh, and thank you, Luis, for those 38 bits. <laughs> Much appreciated. Yeah, and um, 
Oh, I can't read the name. Nazmul. Nazmul says, I, I never do front end tests. The thing is, you could potentially avoid front end tests if you're doing integration tests um, with something like uh, Cypress. Um, you should at least be doing some testing. I don't know. Um, so my answer is be pragmatic, Proxin. I will say that I'm not the best tester, especially if, like, if you've watched my stream here. I don't, I mean, especially on stream, I don't write a lot of tests. At work, I write tests. Yeah. Yeah, there was a fly. I'm just letting him. He's chilling. He's hanging out. The thing is, he's been in my basement for days now. I'm not sure what sustenance <laughs> he has. <laughs> but he is... Oh, there's two flies in here. Maybe it's a new fly bin. Uh, but yeah, I'm just going to let him chill out. Unless they're, like, <laughs> really loud. <laughs> uh, what framework should I use for mobile apps? Um, it really depends... I don't get snapshot tests. You might as well freeze development. I think that's the thing. Like, if your UI is changing often, then yeah, snapshots aren't going to make a lot of sense. Um, yeah. And we just lost that question. <laughs> uh, not Blue Beast. If you're here, type exclamation mark here. Sustenance. Yeah, like, how is that fly surviving? I don't know. Hey, Andrew. Um, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, I think this makes sense, Luis. Can you, um, if you could just put exclamation or mark idea in front of this, it makes sense to go there. Um, combining services. Not sure what you mean by that, but yeah, uh, submit it as an idea for sure. One fly can become multiple flies. You're not wrong. <laughs> uh, cool. So, it, it really, really varies. Uh, so th there are different categories of things. Um, let's type let's type stuff out. Yeah, here. Yeah, they could be living off of the sugar from my drink. <laughs> um, hello, Smiley. So this question comes from not Blue Beast. What framework should I use for mobile apps? Um, my question to you is, do you, do you only have front end experience or have you, um, built mobile stuff? I'll say this. If you only have front end experience, react native might be an option, but the thing is, is it's, um, react native is to front-end development as front-end JavaScript is to back-end JavaScript. It's the same language, so that's useful, but everything else is different. <laughs> the way you write styles is different. The way you write elements is different. Um, but let, let, let's, I mean, let's kind of like break this down into uh, things. So there, there are different types of uh, mobile frameworks. Um, you have um, like a native bridge, and these are things like native script, Vox Ideas is full of me. <laughs> there's Native Script. Uh, there's React Native. Um, there's Vue Native, which I believe is based off of React Native. Does anybody know of other frameworks that are similar to this, like Native Bridges? So Capacitor is actually a hybrid mobile. And I mean, I don't know if Native Bridge is the right word to use here, but, but basically, let's call this like Native UI. Yeah, and Ionic would be under hybrid mobile. Um, and, I'll, and I'll say like Flutter you can would be under here where it, it actually renders a, a native UI. Yeah. Svelte native, that's a thing? That's cool. <laughs> yeah, Flutter. So yeah, so I'm going to break these down into different categories. So you have native UI. So all of these frameworks... At the end of the day, the mobile app that you get is going to render native UI elements, meaning a button is going to look like an iOS button when it's running on iOS, and a button is going to look like an Android button when it's rendered on Android. And so the, all of these frameworks allow you to write your code, but at the end of the day, they're actually building uh, native UIs. Hybrid mobile is a little bit different. So um, uh, typically, if you've heard of like Cordova, 
Um, that's like one of the original things or like phone gap. Um, and then there's a lot of other things that are built on top of them. And now also recently capacitor and, um, uh, Ionic is based off of a uh, capacitor. So you have Ionic. Um, there's also uh, Quasar. Um, there are things like uh, Framework 7. Um, what else? The thing is, like, Capacitor is a new replacement for C Cordova. Um, Xamarin, yeah, we'll say Xamarin is like native UI. Um, not Electron, because Electron is mainly for desktop development. If we're talking about mobile, then um, it's really these things. Well, Vue Native, <laughs> if you've ever looked at it, Vue Native is basically just a wrapper around React Native, which is why I put it as a subnote there. Um, this one, yeah. So it looks like Vue, but at the end of the day, and when you need to start debuggering things, de debugger, <laughs> debugging things, uh, when you need to start debugging things, um, you will probably have to look up the React Native docs. Uh, not that I know of, Shidat. Maybe there's something new I haven't heard of. Carbon React. Let's take a look. Yeah, so these are like front end com front end components, um, and it's possible that you're using these front end components inside of a hybrid mobile framework, um, like something like Cordova or um, Capacitor. Let's debugger. Um, let's see if I missed anything else. Yeah, and, and people were mentioning that Flutter technically renders to a canvas. Yeah, let's not include that here. Let's just talk. Let's just talk about web-related things. So nothing that is like a separate language, because the the thing that all of these have in common is you're typically writing uh, like JavaScript, right? Um, okay, so we have our native UI, which is things like native script, React Native, Svelte Native. Then you have hybrid mobile, so that's things like Quasar, Framework 7, uh, Ionic. Um, what are some other hybrid mobile frameworks? Twelve frameworks for mobile hybrid apps. This is from 2017. Uh, PhoneGap, Framework 7, Kendo UI. Yeah, I think Kindle UI is built on top of um, Cordova anyways. There's Quasar, Aurelia, never heard of that. Onesin, cool. <laughs> oh yeah, that's, I think that's actually a separate category. Yeah, thank you, Irradiated Unicorn. Um, pr progressive Web App, P PWA. This is really like any browser that supports it. <laughs> Gluon Mobile? Never heard of that. Um, oh, this uses Java? Yeah, I think this is the same thing, but it uses Java. Yeah, and, and Dart um, and Michael with the Patreon pledge. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate you. Why does that look so weird? <laughs> oh, well. Uh, but Dart is actually is uh, Flutter. Dart is the language you use with Flutter. Okay, but uh, Andy has a good re re uh, relevant question. Um, a few years back, hybrid apps rarely deliver a satisfactory performance. That's how I remember them. Is hybrid a feasible approach these days? I think it depends. And I'll, I'll say that right now, I am actually building a hybrid application with Ionic uh, for my work, uh, for a client. And for our scenario, it makes sense. Um, I wish an overlay would detect if a drop lands in the cup. <laughs> um, cool. And actually, we have a um, few things. Thank you, Jordan, for that hydrate. And Eric, thank you for that stretch. OK. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the differences between these. So hybrid mobile. Uh, this is a uh, web view running inside a native mobile app. So the way hybrid mobile works is um, your build for Android and your build for um, iOS 
are almost exactly the same in that all they do is expose a web UI and then load in some static HTML, JavaScript, CSS, load in some static assets. Um, and the reason why this potentially is, um, I skipped your question. I skipped a lot of questions. <laughs> so um, for, first thing, if you're new here and you have a question, you'll need to uh, do this. Type exclamation mark Vox in the chat. That'll let you know how it goes. Um, and then we're going off of a, uh, a sorting order based on when those questions were submitted. Cool. So hybrid mobile. You have a web view running inside of a native mobile app. What's up, Jay Felly Web? Welcome to the show. Uh, web view running in a mobile app. Um, and um, DS Legends. Thank you for that pledge as well. Lots of Patreon pledges. I appreciate you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and then you have these uh, these native bridges. So things like uh, Cordova or PhoneGap or Capacitor, all of these things are, um, what do you call it? <laughs> they're a bridge. They're, they're, you can write JavaScript code that does things like access the accelerometer or access the fine tune location or access the camera directly. Um, and these libraries have native code that have been written for like iOS and Android and, and some of the other mobile platforms, but they also provide a JavaScript library that interfaces between them. And so basically with hybrid mobile, almost everything that you know about web development, front end web development, you can use here. At the end of the day, it's just HTML and CSS JavaScript running inside of a view, and then you have access to native capabilities using some of these um, bridges, like Cordova or Capacitor. So um, that's that. Now, uh, these other things are a little bit different. So uh, native UI, so this is some domain-specific language uh, that renders to native UI elements. So with, with these things, you're not running inside of a web view. Um, it, it is, it, when it runs on the device, it looks, looks native. It looks like it was actually written in uh, Swift or in um, Kotlin for, for, for Android or Swift for iOS. So it, it looks like a real native, native UI. Um, and all of these provide some domain specific language that allows you to then render those UI elements. And um, all of these things also provide uh, bridges like Cordova or Capacitor, but they're, they're like built into the frameworks themselves. Um, and this is where like the, the idea of performance comes into play. Because if you have an app that needs to be like super responsive, um, it used to be that you pretty much just wanted to have a native UI. Either you built it with like React Native or you built it directly on iOS or you built it directly on Android. Um, because it's going to be running directly, it, it's going to have a really fast response time, and users are going to feel like it's a native app. Um, now, um, if you do something hybrid mobile, it's possible that that web view is a little bit sluggish. And so for the end user, it doesn't really feel like a native experience. Like they, they see that it's a little bit sluggish. Now, is that the case nowadays? Not really. I mean, most people have a really decent phone that can handle these kinds of things. And uh, if you're, the app that you need to build doesn't need like serious native capabilities, then this is actually a really good option if you already know web development because you won't have to learn any of this domain specific language. You can just use the web development that you know, and then you get access to APIs so you can do native things. Um, so there's that. Uh, and, and then the other scenario is if you're potentially doing like very native things, like you need absolute real time performance of GPS location, you might use something like this. Or if you need to use native maps, because technically if you're using one of these frameworks and you want maps inside of your app, you're really just going to be loading a JavaScript SDK with the map inside of it, and that could potentially be sluggish. Whereas with these, these are going to render the native Apple Maps or the native uh, Google Maps inside of the UI, and then they give you things that allow you to interact with them. And thank you for that, host Smiley. Um, so th th those are the major differences between these two. Um, and the reason I'm not mentioning Flutter is because it's not really web-based. Like it's a, it's its own language. You have Dart. Like whereas these are centered around JavaScript. That's the main reason I'm talking about all of these. Is the main thing they have in common is JavaScript. Um, and then you also have uh, progressive web apps. Now, a progressive web app is just a website, but it takes advantage of all the things that browsers are are able to do nowadays. Because web browsers. 
uh, can do things in the background with service workers. Web browsers can send notifications. Uh, web browsers can get access to the user's location. Uh, web browsers can save things uh, offline to be used later. So technically, you could just build a website that works offline and uses the features of the device without necessarily having to create a full-fledged uh, mobile app. Yeah. Um, and thank you for that stretch, DS Legends. So uh, React is is hybrid in that there's there's still like a JavaScript bridge, but the thing is when it, your your React components are going to build to native UI elements, um, whereas you could use Capacitor with React, and that's just React rendering inside of a web browser. But if you use React here with React Native, then that is it's taking your React code and uh, rendering. Um, um, actual UI elements, and there's there's a bridge that they've written that actually like creates an iOS button natively when you're on iOS, and creates an Android button natively. Yeah, stretch the hamstrings, and thank you, big bro, for that follow. <laughs> um, thank you, Sophia, for that hydrate. And gaming diamond, thank you for that stretch. So how common is native, native native mobile dev these days? Catering for multiple languages and platforms in low languages sounds rough, of course. And this is this would be the main reason that you choose one of these approaches because typically you write you have one code base and that same code base can be built and used on multiple platforms. You, th that one code base can be used on iOS, can be used on Android. Great. Once you start doing like uh, very specific native things where plugins don't exist then you're going to start to have to write native code yourself and native plugins for those different platforms. Um, but th that's usually why, why a company would choose one of these approaches is because otherwise you have to hire a specific iOS developer. You have to hire a specific Android developer. And now you have two separate code bases that need to be main built and maintained. Um, so that's why you would choose to do this. Now, there actually are um, people that still write native native code. I don't know how common it is, but we do it at my company. Um, right now, we have a, a senior Android developer that he's pretty much just written just Android apps all of his life. Um, but on our current project, because we decided to use uh, Capacitor, Ionic, and React, um, he's actually learning web development uh, for this app. And the main reason we chose uh, this for this project is because we needed an iOS app, we needed a Android app, and we needed a web application that could be used by end users and admins and service providers. Um, so if you're on a, a certain budget, you probably won't be able to afford a native build, two native builds and a web build. Whereas right now it's just one build that's going to be working on all the different platforms. And that's the main reason that you would choose it. Um, yeah. <laughs> DSL. I'll type this out. <laughs> I'll call this uh, domain specific language. Yeah. Uh, learning HTML, CSS, JavaScript, React, Ionic, and Capacitor for a single app sounds very rough and overkill. Um, sure, but if you already know those things, then it's it's very easy. Um, and for the same reason I mentioned, if you're trying to build something that's going to work cross-platform and the client doesn't have the budget to pay for several builds, se several separate builds, <laughs> then you would choose a solution like that. So um, to to the to um, why that happen to not blue bees question which is what framework should I use for mobile apps it really depends it really depends I'll say this if you're a web developer and you know HTML CSS and JavaScript um, and you want to build something that works on iOS and Android um, and you're not doing anything that requires really good performance like it, if you're just having like a list of items in a master detail view then any one of these hybrid mobile frameworks um is going to be less of a headache than all of this um and you'll you'll be able to build your apps a lot faster um now if you want to go and start learning like native script and react native and stuff like that um th there's more that you have to learn like you as a react if you're currently a, a react developer that builds react web apps and you want to build a React Native app, there's a lot you need to learn. If you're currently a React developer, web developer, and you want to build a mobile app with Capacitor and Ionic, there's barely anything new that you need to learn. Hopefully that's clear enough. 
And I, I'm open to uh, thoughts that other people have in the chat if we want to keep talking about this. Like, what do you think? What do you prefer? Um, yeah. Yeah, React Native seems cool. I'll, I'll say that I've had... Uh, I've had... I've, go I've gone through rough times with React Native because um, they were slowly updating their CLI and now uh, they're based off of the Expo CLI. And so if you have older projects that were on the React CLI, you'll have a hard time. Uh, Flutter and Dart isn't on this list because it's not JavaScript, but Flutter and Dart is probably clo closer to native UI. But the other thing to think about with Flutter or Dart is that you have to learn the Dart programming language. Now I will say, the, the style of building apps with Flutter and Dart is very similar to React. It's unidirectional data flow, um, it's functional style, and um, data is not immutable. So those concepts will transfer over, but you do have to learn a new language and, and new syntax. Oh, a view library, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I will repeat myself. <laughs> if you are a React developer and you, you build websites with React, if you choose like capacitor and ionic with react there's basically zero th new things you need to learn and you can start building mobile apps if you want to start building apps with react native there's actually quite a bit that you need to learn because the the syntax is the same jsx is the same but you have to learn about all the different uh ui components you have to learn about styling um you have to use their cli tools um it's a lot more yeah, and the current mobile app that I have with the push notifications, I built that using Ionic, so I'll be working on that pretty soon. And thank you, Majestic Eye for the Hydrate. Yeah, for sure. Uh, unidirectional data flow has to do with uh, how state is managed inside of React. Um, if you want me to go in more depth, you can ask it on <laughs> the um, the... Uh, Vox website. I'm having trouble saying words. I've only been live for an hour. <laughs> yeah, and Ying Ying uh, is saying it. So it depends on what you're trying to develop. For basic apps, JavaScript's pretty good. Um, but yeah, if you're trying to build games, you probably want to go native. Like, you might not even want to go with this. You might want to go full native. Um, you potentially could get something done with, like, React Native. Um, if you want like really performant maps and maybe like drawing on maps and stuff like that, you probably either want this or even native itself. If you're just showing dots on a map, hybrid mobile is totally fine. I do not drink orange lemonade. <laughs> uh, we're not building an app, we're just answering questions. Exclamation mark Vox, you can see what we're answering. Yeah. Okay, so there's that. Thank you very much, uh, Not Blue Beast, for the question. Too much debuggering. <laughs> cool. If you do exclamation mark here, uh, if, if you have asked a question, type exclamation mark here and I'll take a look. Yeah, I'll take a look at ideas. Um, Docker tutorial. Quotes. Noob quest. Add a command to lockvox. Yeah. Maybe. I don't, I'm okay with not locking it. Five minute timer? What's that for? <laughs> Uh, you're welcome, Not Blue Beast. Yeah, feel free to ask on the Discord if you have more more questions. Oh, nice. It's good to hear Ying Ying. I, I really like feathers. And thank you, Princess, for that stretch. My front dot page. Oh, my frong page. <laughs> you spelled it wrong here, Andrew. <laughs> I don't know if I want to click that link. I don't know if I do. Um... Yeah, I'm not going to look at ideas because this is really for when we're trying to implement custom things. I just need to answer these questions because there are a hundred of them. <laughs> um, so um, it looks suspicious. My front page? Send, send the link again so that I can click it because you did my frong page instead of my front page. <laughs> 100. <laughs> the page is safe. Here we go. Create your own new tab page for your browser without any kit, any code. Why is it? Why is there a period on the end? Your personal front page of the internet. You want me to read this? <laughs> I'm trying to answer questions. 
A radically new take on browser new tab pages. Use my front page to create your own new tab page for your browser, featuring the time, your favorite websites for quick access, the weather, and so much more. Oh, that's interesting. So it's kind of like a new tab page like this, but you can share it with the world. OK. Um, what's special about it? I don't know, regardless, uh, it's free advertising. So <laughs> whoever your friend is, there are hundreds of people potentially going to my front that page. Seems cool. Um, all right. Uh, <laughs> was there a period in the, yeah. Oh, there was a period on the sentence. That's why, that's why. Yeah. And hello, Jorge, welcome. Slow day at the plant. Uh, I have, we have Flex Fridays, so I'm, I'm off today. <laughs> All right, this question comes from David, who says, is it possible to animate between nav links in React Router? Um, yes, I've never done it. It's definitely possible. Um, what you probably want to look for is, like, um, the React, React Router route animation. Basically, the, the parent component that all of the routes get loaded into. Um, you can add some custom stuff there that um, automatically an animates between the different routes. Let's see. We're just going to look up React Router animation. Animated transitions. Tyler McGinnis, great resource for React stuffs. URL params. Yeah, transition group could definitely work. I, but I think there's, a, there's like a way built into React Router itself. Hmm. I did a thing. All right, I'll check it out, Andrew. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> so you basically built a front page that looks like this. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Um, oh, you mean, what do you mean by the links? Um, like, so for an individual link, you want to like hide it or show it? What do you mean by animating the links? Oh, it's a new programmer joke. That's cool. <laughs> this is weird. No, I mean, I, I think I, I get what's happening here because you're just binding the styles and then setting the styles based on route params. But this is not what I meant. Because, um, like, oh, here we go. So uh, here's a transition group. What, when are they going to use this? No. Uh, I'm sure this will work, but this just seems so convoluted. There, there's definitely an, an easier way just to say, like, the element that's being swapped out uh, should be animated. OK, a nav link has an active class name, and that active class name might change the background. But I want to animate that background from one link to another. Oh, so you have like a nav bar, and then you have <laughs> um, multiple nav elements. And when you click on one, you want the, the highlight background to like move across the screen to another element. Is that what you're asking? Why does it always say I am an eligible to upgrade to tier two? Because I think you are tier two? I don't know, Greg. That's weird. Yep. Well, my friend, uh, you just have to write it. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's nothing built in. Uh, basically, you would have to like absolutely position the div behind the active element. Um, and then you can potentially do, you, you could listen for when the route changes and then move that absolutely positioned div um, based on that. And if you use a CSS transform, it'll automatically animate from one place to another. It could be fun to implement. It would probably take me like an hour to implement that. <laughs> hydrate yourself. <laughs> Do we have a we have a hydrate? <laughs> Thank you, the big bro. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, and thank you, a monster, for that host. Um, but what do you think? Do you want to, Do you want to see me implement this? This could be fun to code. I will admit. Um. I am feeling weird right now. 
<laughs> I did like scarf down my lunch, but I'm I am not feeling zen. I will admit. Um, let's do it. Andy would want to see it. Yes for implementing. Yeah, type one in the chat if you want to see me make that thing. Do it later. <laughs> the person that asked doesn't even want to see it. <laughs> People want to see it. All right. Um, the thing is, uh, and I, and I will I will mention this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put this in the uh, in the README right now. Um. Let's try to answer one or two more questions, and if we don't find anything else to code, we'll code on that. But this is this actually reminds me of a video that Dev Ed posted. Hello, Coding Pasta. Welcome, welcome. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for thinking about others. <laughs> you grew out your hair like me in a day. Um, yeah, so search for Dev Ed. He's a YouTuber. Navbar, maybe? JavaScript animated navbar tutorial. Greg with the gifted sub. Thank you very much, Greg. And congrats to Mishka. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Sub to see it. <laughs> yeah, so you can see how when he's scrolling, it, it moves the, the color back there. Yeah, so you can check this out. This is with vanilla JavaScript, though. It's not with um, not with React. And we, we could do something similar. Uh, we're not doing code reviews. We're just answering questions. Because we we now have more questions than when, <laughs> when we started. <laughs> oh, his intros are always really funny. Um, he was pretending to be um, Brad Traversy, who's another YouTuber. Cool. All right. If you are here and you have asked a question, type exclamation mark here so we can be sure that we see the, uh, the latest questions um, that have been asked. I'll give you a minute to do that. And then we're going to answer the first question from somebody who's not a sub, a mod, or a VIP. This one. <clears throat> My hair brought is broken. Well, that's unfortunate. Uh, Brad Chaversy, does Brad Chaversy say Jason instead of Jason? <laughs> If you do exclamation mark Vox, you can get a, a description of what this thing is. Cool. I'll go ahead and answer this one. So Maple has the question, is there an industry standard for styling in React.js? Maybe some React devs can share what they use at their jobs. Here, bot? Oh. Just trigger that same code on any chat message. Sabuza with three sub. Thank you very much, Sabuza. I don't know what you mean by that, Doc. Um, okay, um, I'll mention all the different ways to do it. So this this question comes from Maple. It's a good question, and this is one of the reasons I don't like React because there are so many options, um, and none of I mean um, some of them are industry standard in that a lot of people use them, but no two projects use the same thing. Um, everybody has a different opinion. Now I'll show you what I use, and what I use actually is not very popular. Uh, it's a thing called CSS and JS. Um, not jobs, JS, like that. <laughs> um, CSS in JS. Oh. Yeah, I just didn't want to pound my back in with database updates, is the reason, Doc. I, I, I get what you're saying. And thank you, uh, Shubham. I'll see you later. Uh, cool. So this is the library that I'm talking about, CSS in JS. Um, now, I'll talk about the things that I like about this. For one, um, it automatically supports uh, SCSS or SAS syntax. So you can do things like nested selectors um, and different things like that. What's cool about this is this actually injects a dynamic style sheet into your web page. And then the other thing I like about this is um, you can use um, just like JavaScript object syntax. And so all of your linter styles and everything like that um, can be applied to your CSS CSS as well, which I really like about it. And so there's a, a React JSS library that allows you to hook this up to a React component. And basically, you can define the styles that you want. Um, it can get injected either with a higher order component or with a, uh, a hook. 
and then you can access those classes here. And so uh, this is very different than just inline styles because you actually can encapsulate your styles in, uh, in here and then reuse them potentially in different components. So there's that. Um, so there's that. Um, I'll say the other way is just inline styles. And that is, uh, you literally put an object, um, um, an object with styles on your React element. Don't do this. You can do this, but it's not scalable. Um, it's, it's really hard to share styles between components. Um, you're basically doing inline styles, so it's really hard to overwrite them with like uh, CSS specific specificity and stuff like that. So yeah. Uh, is dynamic style sheet that strange empty? There's a, there's a chat delay. I'll wait for you to finish your thought, Andy. <laughs> Hello, Mint Jim. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, so um, they, they're not necessarily limited to that file. So the, the, typically the way that I like to set it up is I will have a um, styles that are global to my entire app, and then I can import the, those styles in that hook into any component that I want to use, and that makes them reusable. So you basically have this defined in a file called like global styles or app styles. And then any component that wants to use the app styles can just use the hook, and it has access to them. And in here, instead of calling it classes, I'll call it like app classes. Um, and then if there are component-specific styles, I'll define that separately. The other thing is like this works for like sub parts of your application as well, because you can have top-level app styles that are shared everywhere. Uh, subsection apps, like uh, style or uh, subsection styles. So uh, styles that are only applied to your dashboard but are used in multiple components, that could be defined in a separate file as well. And because it's just a JavaScript object, you technically could um, just use spread or object assign to um, share styles between different things. Uh, and then the other thing I like is you can define like your color palette just in a JavaScript object. So that way, um, your colors can be accessed inside of uh, JSS like this, but you can also use them and pass them as props if you if you need to. Now, this is not the best way. This is just the way that I've found that I like to use and, and work with styles in React. Um, and it's slightly different from styled components. I'm going to talk about styled components next. Yeah. Yes, and uh, this is what I was about to show. The reason I started using CSS in JS is because of Material UI. Material UI just uses uh, CSS in JS under the hood. Yeah, and thank you, Viewlancer, for that host. Yeah. CSS should always be separated. Yeah, I mean, it's technically separated, but it's written in JavaScript. Uh, it supports inline styles, but like I mentioned, it's not scalable because you're going to have duplicate styles everywhere. It's hard to share styles. Uh, you can do media queries directly in your in your JSS. So, uh, just like this. So you have a proper. So you have a top level property that's the name of the class, and then you have a property that's a media query. And these styles will apply to this selector when this media query is satisfied. Yeah. Linaria. I'll check it out. Linaria. <laughs> is that a React thing? Zero runtime CSS in JS library. Style JSX. And what's up, Andreas? It's been a while since I've seen you around here. Um, yeah, the next thing we'll look at is uh, style components. So I'll say uh, to, 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 uh, to their question, uh, is there an industry standard? There is no industry standard. There's a lot of different options. CSS and JS is one. Another one is um, styled components. Hello, Zero is Eon. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> I had the great idea of suggesting a mono repo, and now I'm tasked with setting up CI. Yeah, CI is a little bit tricky because, I mean, for each of the nested apps, you potentially need a separate, uh, like, container. Yeah. Oh, and then scope styles as well. Styled components, and then also CSS modules is another one. OK, styled components. Uh, there is a website, literally, styled-components.com. And the way this works is it, you, you get a, a, t a tagged template function that you can pass con uh, styles into. Um, so uh, yeah, and the thing is, you can use BIM with any one of these things that I mentioned. So you can use BIM with CSS and JS if you, if you want. Um, it's, it's really just like a naming convention. Yeah. 
Constantly lurking. I'm famous. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not famous. <laughs> Thank you, Andreas. See you later, lethal error. Thanks for being here. Okay, so styled components, you say styled.component type. Like this is going to give you an anchor tag that has these styles attached to it. Um, you potentially get access to the props. And then um, you're, you're putting in this in a variable called button. Oh, nice. Team node. Nice. So you're putting this in a variable called button, which creates a component. And then now you can use that component and uh, do things with it. So right here, we're using button. But technically, all of those styles that we defined above are injected into that button. Um, let's look at some other examples. Um, documentation. I don't know if this is the most, it's, this might be the most popular way. I don't like it. <laughs> I'll say that. Uh, Styling any component. <laughs> and thank you, RG Colombo, for that follow. Just use SAS. The thing is, if you're trying to create styles specific for a component, even if you're using SAS, you still technically need to have like um, globally registered styles, because th there's no way to only import CSS for one specific component in React. There's no built-in way to do that. You have to use a library like this, um, or something like CSS modules. Um, CSS modules allow you to define like a single SAS file, and then it makes it so that those styles can be imported, and they're only imported and used in that one place. Um, I can't find a good example of this. This is probably why I don't like it. <laughs> it's just because it's so hard to figure out what they even mean by it. But that's another option. Um, and then the other option was, um, like, I don't know if this is a React thing. React scope styles. Rebase. I prefer CSS and JS. Primitive UI components built with styled system. Interesting. So yeah, you have like a flex component. Interesting. Um, inline style CSS modules and styled components. So maybe those are the those are the main things. Um, okay. So CSS modules is a okay. A CSS module is a CSS file in which all class names and animations are scoped locally by default. CSS modules compile to low-level um, interchange format, but are written like normal CSS files. Yeah. And so um, this is the major difference, right? If, if you have ever written a React app and you type uh, and you have in that code import styles.css without putting it in a variable, you just say import styles.css, those styles are going to be imported and added to the page every single place that that component is being used or every place that that component is imported into, which you do not want. But if you do this, this now gives you like a JavaScript object that has all of the class names on it that you can then use inside of your inside of your component. And this this is these are styles that are only going to be applied when you say like styles dot whatever name. It's not going to add them as globally available styles. So yeah, CSS modules, um, another option. Um, yeah. Oh, you use the, that uh, rebase thing you use at work. That's pretty cool. I'm doing pretty good. How are you in for math music? <laughs> Style sheets as a service. Yeah. Um, but I will, I will say as someone who's been writing react for the past two years, um, all of these options are just ridiculous and horrible when you compare how easy it is to do things in Vue.js. I'll say that. <laughs> and you can see, like, you can even see it from the chat. Many people have bit different opinions on which one you should pick and choose. Um, whereas in Vue, there's just scope styles built right in. You put the word scoped on your, your style tag, and those styles only apply to the component. Um, you also have CSS modules where you can, like, get access to props and stuff like that. But yeah, and thank you, Smiley, for that posture check. I'm sitting weird. Remove jQuery. <laughs> yeah, I could talk about really quick what SAS is. Uh, and thank you for that hydrate, Cheyenne. Cheers. What's up, John? Welcome back. And see you later, the big bro. Thanks for dropping by. 
Um, probably about a day, I'll say that. Yeah, React Native uses a CSS and JS-like syntax. I don't know if it's the same library, but it looks very similar. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> View is much nicer. <laughs> uh, React has just been around longer and people just keep using it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to try not to talk bad about React. Um, what was I about to do? Oh, yeah, let's talk about what uh, SAS is. <laughs> yeah, the answer is um, pick the one, just like every other React developer, pick the one that makes the most sense to you. And for me, this makes the most sense. Uh, I guess the other option is um, none of these things and just um, global CSS. <laughs> Like you can literally just define one or I mean, you can still write CSS in a scalable way. I feel like dancing. Nice. You can still write CSS in a scalable way and like have multiple files and have like a decent import structure and stuff like that. Um, but you just have it all defined at a global level and then um, use those class names inside of your React components. That's totally fine, too. Okay, what's up, uh, Imcarv, Kim Carval? Welcome, welcome. But let's talk about real quick what is SAS. So, um, if you're if you're new to programming and web development, and all this stuff, um, CSS is the language that uh, controls the styles, right? Um, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, and in Vue, um, there's just a style tag. You put your styles inside of it, and if you put the word scoped on the style tag, those styles that you define will only be applied to that component. They are not global styles. So it's as easy as that. You don't need any extra external library or anything like that. Um, but if, if you're completely and totally new to web development, type one in the chat. And it's OK. It's OK that you're new. <laughs> you don't have to be afraid. <laughs> yeah, and that's the other cool thing in Vue is you can say, hey, I want scope styles and I want to use SAS. Or you could use less or any, any one of these other preprocessors as well. Cool. Um, let's just talk about like the, the basics of, of web pages. So let's say I have like this H1. This is a header that's of size one. And inside of it, we say, hello world, like that. So this is going to put an H1 on the page that looks like that. Um, there are different kinds of tags, right? So uh, a P tag is a paragraph tag. And a P tag, uh, by default, shows up a lot smaller and normal. But H1 is how we make like a, like a big heading, like that. Cool. So that's the HTML. <laughs> Um, CSS is the, are the things that style it. And so what, what we were just talking about is uh, different ways of doing styles in a thing called React, which is even like deeper and different than that. But with CSS, um, that's how you, you change how things appear on the page. So with CSS, I can select an element. So I'll say, select all the H1s on the page and set their color to be red. And then it changes to be red. So this is CSS. Um, there are other ways of selecting elements, like you can put classes. So here I can say class equals heading. And then in my CSS, I can say uh, select the elements with the class heading. So I have dot heading. And here, the color should be red. Yeah, <laughs> CSS got. <laughs> so there are different ways to select. And, and what we were talking about is basically how do you do styles like this when you have a much more complex application and you're using something like React? Um, and like we just saw, there's a bunch of different options. Now, the question also came up, what is SAS? So uh, CSS is the language that's supported by the web browser. Um, this is, this is the, pretty much the only thing you can use to change the style of things on web page. Any web page you go to that looks interesting is using CSS behind the scenes. But there are a lot of limitations to CSS. Um, it's very cumbersome to like uh, write a lot of rules and reuse those rules and, and different things like that. So people have invented um, what are known as uh, preprocessors or languages that sit right above CSS um, that can be turned into CSS, but they give you a lot of extra features. And that's what something like SAS is. Uh, should I start looking for CSS3 or CSS? Oh, I mean, honestly, if you just search for CSS, any tutorial you find is going to... Um, is going to list the latest CSS features, at least in, in my experience. Uh, CSS3 just means things like transitions and animations and um, some of the newer features that got added. But 
those are almost just like commonplace nowadays. Thank you mu very much, Uberbra, for that Twitch Prime sub. <laughs> Appreciate ya. Um, okay, so CSS, the styling language of the web. Of the web. However, it's very cumbersome to do things. So people have created languages that sit above it that can be turned into CSS. And SAS is one of those things. So SAS um, has a bunch of features in it, like uh, variables. So um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Esfrido. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a similar question. Like it, this, this question was relevant maybe five years ago, a few years ago. But nowadays, if you say HTML or you say CSS, People know that you mean HTML5 or CSS3. Yeah. Owner CSS is going to get some features that SAS has. Yeah, I mean, and it slowly is. So, I mean, I was going to mention that you couldn't do, you can't do variables in CSS, but you actually can now. Um, but the thing is, like, all of the all of these languages that we're talking about, CSS, HTML, they're they're living languages. You can look up the the specification for them, and they. Um, they change over time. Like we were just talking about CSS versus CSS3. CSS3 introduced a lot of new properties. Um, and now I don't know if it's CSS4 or 5, whatever, but that has actually introduced variables. But before that, we didn't have variables. Uh, and less is similar to SAS. Yeah, so CSS supported by the browser. And then you have these higher level preprocessors. So SAS is a preprocessor. Uh, less um, is a preprocessor. Let's look it up. Less CSS. Um, Stylus is a preprocessor, stylus lang. What are some other preprocessors? Anybody know? Yeah, we've got stylus, less, sass. Yeah, and so uh, sass is synonymous with SCSS. Th those two are the same thing, uh, for the most part. They're, I mean, the syntax is technically slightly different. <laughs> um, but he here's the... <laughs> oh, yeah, and uh, I guess I'll show that. So on here, I think we can select a preprocessor. Um, post CSS is performed on CSS itself. Technically, you could use any one of these preprocessors, but then you would take the output of that and run it through post CSS. Um, oh, yeah, you can choose your preprocessor. That's pretty sweet. Uh, less, SAS, Stylus. OK, those are the main ones. And then post CSS just adds automatically adds prefixes. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, we're getting a little sidetracked, but this this is it. So these are these higher level languages. And just like with front end frameworks or programming languages, everyone has their own opinion and, and way of doing things. But technically, you could choose any one of these preprocessors, like Stylus, Less, or Sass. And at the end of the day, it's just going to generate CSS. But each one has their own specific rules about how you can do extra things. So um, and, and like I mentioned, uh, there are things that didn't used to exist in CSS, and now they do. And because they didn't used to exist in CSS, that's why people created these preprocessors like SAS or less. But uh, you have variables. You have nested selectors. So uh, in uh, SAS or SCSS, which they're synonymous, the main difference between SCSS and SAS is white space. So the reason I like SCSS is because it looks almost exactly like CSS. The only major difference is that you have nesting, but with SAS, it's white space. So you actually don't have the curly braces. So I do prefer this syntax. Um, but you can see we have the nav selector, and then we have uh, so, uh, element selectors inside of that. And at the end of the day, we need to run it through a tool that generates actual CSS. So you would write your SAS like this, and then this would generate this CSS and this is the CSS that you would actually send to the end user on your website. So um, you do things like nesting. Uh, partials are nice because you can define like base styles in one file and then use them everywhere else. Um, you have mix-ins, which are kind of like functions, and they allow you to um, write some sort of like reusable style code that you can apply to different selectors. Um, you can extend selectors. Um, you have interesting math operators like divide and multiply. Um, and so basically, there's a lot of cool features in these languages that don't exist in CSS. And like less, I'm actually not that familiar with less. Um, let's see, what are the features? There's there's some features in there. <laughs> but um, the, the main thing is each one of these is a preprocessor, and at the end of the day, uh, it's going to generate CSS. So that that's what SAS is. It's a preprocessor. It's it's one of the most popular ones. Um, and the reason they exist is because these types of features don't exist in CSS yet. But eventually, 
Um, yeah, and that's exactly what I was about to say. In about three years, all these features will be added to default CSS. So eventually, like two, three years from now, you probably won't need one of these preprocessors anymore. Uh, for the most part, because most things will just be built directly into uh, CSS. Um, and uh, when that's when that happens, that's great, because we don't need preprocessors anymore. Yeah. But the thing is, everything is always evolving. Um, evolving. Yeah, I would say SCSS um, is the same thing as SAS. The only difference is the syntax. So if we look at the SAS syntax, it, it looks very similar to CSS. It has curly braces and semicolons. But if you look at the SAS syntax, um, it, it's a little less busy. There are no curly braces and there are no semicolons. It's, it's white space based instead of uh, more similar to CSS. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so that's what SAS is. And we got some follows. I appreciate you. Thank you, uh, Jay Pino, for, follow, for the follow. And uh, Lakeaboom, thanks for being here. Um, SAS is greater than SAS. <laughs> TypeScript or JavaScript? I prefer JavaScript. Uh, it, it really, really depends. Yeah, and so it's white space based. So uh, it's less verbose, but it does look a little interesting. Yeah, and, and the la uh, another thing I'll mention is uh, like this website, Can I Use? So. Um, if we look up like CSS variables, yeah. So this website will let you look up features of JavaScript, features of the browser, features of CSS, and it will tell you what web browsers support those features. So there, there is this feature, like I mentioned, CSS variables, um, that is now supported in most major browsers. Um, you can see that it's not supported in IE 11, <laughs> but in all of these other ones, for the most part, it's supported. But if you look like several versions back, uh, CSS variables didn't exist in Chrome version 48 or Opera version 35. So back then, we really needed a preprocessor because we couldn't do things like create variables in CSS. Um, <laughs> and so uh, this, this I'll, I'll link this website. It's really cool. You can search for all the things and see where they're supported. Um, yeah, and that's another one. Fetch is supported everywhere except for IE 11. IE 11 is just way, way behind. And it's really unfortunate because a lot of enterprises still use IE 11. Um, Cool, great. We talked about that. That was fun. Thank you for the question, um, Maple. And then also whoever asked about what is SAS. That was a good question too. All right, where did that question go? Um, did I, I? I need a way to pin questions because <laughs> I lost it. Oh, but thank you, Maple. That was, that was a good question. No, exactly. Yeah, and I think uh, those packages, like isomorphic isomorphic fetch or one of the other ones, um, they um, they have code in them that says, like, if it exists, don't overwrite it. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> SAS means SAS CSS. It's like a recursive uh, acronym. A Discord Twitch bridge. Cool. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gl glad, glad you could be here, Imkar. Um, all right. If you're here and you have asked a question, type exclamation mark here. We can be sure to get to your question. Or try to. Not be sure. We're going to try. I'll answer this one because it's easy. Uh, what theme do I use in VS Code? It's called Just Black. If you do exclamation mark theme, you can get a link to my VS Code theme. Um, and if you do exclamation mark VS code, you can get a link to all of my settings and plugins and stuff like that. Yeah, cool. 29 degrees Celsius, that's hot. That's hot, right? <laughs> well, it's actually really cool in my basement, you're right. Uh, what I think about Dino, I know it's small. Um, no, I, I think it's a really cool idea. It's gonna take some while before it, it picks up traction, but overall it's really interesting and cool. The questions are great. Yeah, it only gets more and more and more. 45 Celsius in India? Wow. Um, OK, let's just go to the top. Can I do a Python stream? Eventually. Yeah, I'm not opposed to that. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> oh, why do I have a beanie when it's so hot outside? Uh, Kit Boga friends, welcome, welcome. How's it going? Oh, are you kidding me? There's no way. <laughs> I don't believe you, <laughs> but welcome, Boga friends. Um, uh, 
Uh, I think people are. I think people are just. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have to take a moment to collect my thoughts and my breath. If this is really happening, everything's okay. <laughs> Stress test. <laughs> Thank you, Acelera, for that hydrate. Brace yourself. <laughs> Think of an intro. <laughs> oh, you all are silly. Thank you for that posture check. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for those follows. Uh, Twister and Cheb Jeb. Welcome, welcome. I think I might have done the posture check, Raid. It's it's happening. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, Kitboga friends. There are 6,000 of you. That's insane. There, are, You're going to break my overlay. <laughs> there have literally never been this many people anywhere near my channel. Uh, <laughs> my overlay is broken. <laughs> Thank you all for the follows. Uh, welcome to the coding garden. Um, today is a very, very chill stream. And uh, my over... <laughs> We love you. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Kit Boga, for that Twitch Prime sub. <laughs> um, insane. Welcome, welcome. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you all trickle in. <laughs> Maybe my overlay will be able to catch up. I don't know. I've never, we've never stress tested this many, this many messages. This is a custom overlay. It's like a Electron app. <laughs> all right. I think the best thing to do is probably just look at Twitch chat. Whoa. <laughs> Thank you so much. Kit Bogan with the 10 gifted. Thank you so much. 146 follows. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. What do we do? I think the best thing to do is just I'm gonna I'm gonna close this overlay. <laughs> my overlay can't handle it. Um, thank you very much for the Twitch Prime sub. Thank you for the bits. Oh, what do, what do we do? What do we do? <laughs> All right, I'm going to collect myself, and then uh, we're all going to learn something. Type one in the chat if you want to learn something. We'll learn learn, learn some, something about coding today. <laughs> Ripley with the five gifted subs. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. All right, let's learn about coding. So um, this, is the, this is the coding garden. <laughs> uh, typically, I, I teach and we build applications. Today, we were answering questions. There's a ton of follows and a ton of gifts. We're already at level four. <laughs> uh, Boga, Boga one, Boga one, is that it? Yeah, Boga one in the chat. Uh, cool. Let's let's learn about coding. So <laughs> Codepin is a really cool uh, website where you can um, you can look at code that other people have written, but you can build very basic websites. So uh, I am going to teach you the basics of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. <laughs> Thank you for the bits. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that would actually be really interesting to see. So actually, if everyone types exclamation mark drop, um, you're gonna see emotes fall from the sky. Oh, you're gonna see, um, um, what do you call it? Seedlings drop. And if they land here, it grows. <laughs> Thanks for all the support, everyone. <laughs> An instant level five hype train. All right, we're about to see my overlay struggle that's not so bad. That's not, that's not so bad. Oh, it's it's gonna struggle. <laughs> um, I think. <laughs> Thank you, a beautiful Samira. Yeah, Kim Boba is awesome. Um, in in uh, <laughs> in all of this, I um I totally forgot. We should. I mean, if you haven't heard of Kit Boga, you should definitely check out Kit Boga. He does really cool streams where he um calls scammers and pranks them. We've we've broken my overlay. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> um let me do that. Maybe? No, it's impossible. All right, I, I have to disable it. <laughs> All right, let's learn to code. We're here to code. Okay. So, um, I teach I teach mainly about JavaScript and web development, but if you go to this website codepin.io, you you right now if you've never written code a day in your life, you can learn to code. Um, the first thing I'm going to teach you is HTML. Um, HTML, <laughs> thank you for all the subs. Yes. 
Uh, HTML is the uh, is the building blocks of a website, right? So like if you go to a website like uh, no, not Google, DuckDuckGo. If you go to DuckDuckGo.com, uh, there's stuff here, right? There's an image, there's an input box, there's text. HTML will allow us to lay those things out on the page. Um, so um, HTML works with tags. So I can have a tag that is like a P, a P tag. <laughs> <laughs> People are like, gift me. <laughs> Thank you for all the follows. <laughs> okay, but we've created a P tag. P stands for paragraph. It's not what you think. And inside of a paragraph, we can actually type text like, hello world. And if I do this, watch, it will appear right there. So we have the text, hello world. Beautiful. So that's the structure of the web page. Uh, let's also add an image. Uh, we're going to search DuckDuckGo for Kip Boga. Let's see what comes up. That one. <laughs> Let's just grab that one. <laughs> and so there are other tags like image tags like this. Um, and we can uh, set the source attribute. So tags can also have attributes and we can set that to be an image URL. So if I put that URL in there and then save, we see an image on the page. Beautiful. <laughs> so that's HTML. It's the base, base structure of website. Every website you go to is, is built off of that. The other thing is uh, styles or CSS. So uh, we can make this look better and more interesting. So um, let's say I want to style the P tag here, this paragraph tag. I can uh, select it. <laughs> Thank you for all the Twitch Prime subs, everyone. It's not slowing down. Um, so much support. Oh my goodness. All the bits and the subs. Thank you. Thank you. We're at a 300% hype train. First time in Coding Garden history. <laughs> Okay, so let's keep let's keep learning. Okay, so we have the basics of a website. We have text. We have images. Now we can control the style of the website. So, um, on the uh, let's say I want to change this p tag to be much bigger. So in my CSS, I can say, hey, let's select the p tag, and then inside of curly braces, I can define the styles that I want. So let's say I want this text to be really big. So I'm going to say uh, font size is 42 pixels. And if I do that, boom, text is way bigger. <laughs> Um, and let's say we also want like a nicer font style. So let's say uh, the um, font family is <laughs> something like sans serif. Um, and if you look at that now, it's a it's a it's a little nicer to look at. So by default, the browser shows it as like Times New Roman. But if you do this, uh, you get like a nice font with no serifs on it. So that's great. Uh, what let's say we want to center the text. I can say text align center. Look at that. Um, and let's say I want to center the image as well. I can also set its text align to center. Thank you all for the bits. I'm going to go back through <laughs> after, after all of this. Uh, after all of this, I'll go through and acknowledge and thank everyone. Um, it's kind of hard to read the chat right now. Hype, level three hype train. Well, great, great job. Oh, no, we got to level five, but I got a level three hype emote. So that's good. <laughs> Has anyone learned anything in the five minutes that you've been here? Type one in the chat if you've learned something. <laughs> thank you all for the support. I appreciate you. Cool. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're out here learning. Thank you. Thank you for that Twitch sub. <laughs> we're out here learning. Cool. So we've got the structure. That's the tags. We've got the style. Um, this did not work on the image. Um, what we probably need to do is set set up some margin. Let's see. So if I do margin zero automatic, let's say uh, display block. There we go. <laughs> so there, there's a lot of extra properties in there um, to learn about. So you can change the display of an element. Margin is the space around an element. So what I'm saying here is that there should be no space on the top and bottom of the element, so it should be zero. And then auto means it should have automatic margin on the sides. So that, that centers it here. There are like 50 other ways to center things in CSS. Like you see text align, sometimes it works, sometimes you have to do other things, you can do that. Oh, great. All right. <laughs> we have a basic web page. Um, welcome, Kitboga friends. Cool. Yeah, cool. So we have a web page. All right. So those are the two parts of, uh, of, of web development. You have the, the structure, that's HTML. You have the CSS, that can change the style and the layout. And then we have JavaScript. 
And JavaScript can make a page interactive. Um, so let's do this. Whenever I click on this image, we'll, we'll pop up a message that says something interesting. So um, JavaScript, um, what can I say about JavaScript? It's a programming language. <laughs> so there are a lot of other programming languages out there, and JavaScript one is one of them. You've probably heard of like C or C++ or C Sharp and, or PHP. They're all programming languages. JavaScript is one. Um, so what I need to do in my JavaScript is I need to write code that gets access to this image, image element. So what I can do is I can say uh, document. So document is provided for us in the browser, and it lets us access elements or, or pick and choose them. Thank you. Thank you for the bits. <laughs> So if I say uh, document dot um, query selector, uh, what I can do with this is inside of these parentheses, I can put any valid CSS selector, right? So uh, just like I showed in the CSS, the p tag selects any p on the on the page inside of our CSS, or the image tag or the image here selects any image inside of the HTML, right? In our JavaScript this query selector works in a very similar way. So if I put quotes in here and then I put IMG, we have now selected the image inside of our JavaScript. And now we can do something interesting. So I've selected it. I want to put it somewhere so I can access it. I'm going to put it in a variable. So I'll say uh, my image is equal to um, that. So I have this variable called image. And now I want to listen for when somebody clicks on it. So I'm going to say, uh, image dot uh, add event listener. So <laughs> we're going to listen for when someone clicks on the image. And if they click the image, we're going to do something interesting. Um, and thank you. Thank you all so much for the support. <laughs> Wait, weren't we on like a minute slowdown? <laughs> <Yeah>. Slow mode is boring. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. We're going to make this work. Thank you, Red Bunny, for those bits. Um, so when the user clicks this element, we want to do something. And for that, we need to pass it a function. Um, if you're totally new to programming, function, there, there's a lot to learn about functions and, and different stuff. Like, why is this arrow here? People use the function keyword. Just don't worry about that. Just know that this is, we're going to put code inside these curly braces that runs when uh, this element is clicked on. Um, all right, we're just going to do an alert. <laughs> and we're going to say alert. Just wait a moment. <laughs> and so if I've done everything correctly, uh, whenever I click on this image, um, it will say, just wait a moment. Just wait a moment. <laughs> so that's awesome. Um, the other thing we could do is like uh, when you're building websites, you want to you want to you want to let the user know that um, that they can actually interact with the website, right? So right now, when I hover over the image, it's just a it's just a regular cursor. But I can make it so that when I hover, uh, we can say cursor is pointer, um, and that way the user will know. Oh, hey, look at that! I can I can click on this image. Just wait a moment. <laughs> wait a moment. Cool. Um, learn the basics is what we're gonna call this. Cool. So I'll save that. Um, and then the other cool thing about this website is you can actually, sh after you after you build things, you can share it with people. So uh, yeah, let's go to the full page view. Yeah, look at that. So I'll put this link in the chat and anybody, anybody can go to that link and click the image. <laughs> um, and if you, and the, the other cool thing about CodePen is if you wanna change the code, um, right here, you can, you can click this and then go to editor view. And you can see all of the code that I wrote. Oh, thank you, funny dude, for those bits. Um, but you can see the code that I wrote, and you can start playing around with this. You can uh, change the tags. You can change the CSS. You can change the, the JavaScript and make it do different things. Um, cool. So that was the basics. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, if you learn something, type one. I don't know. I, I guess some of you already learned learned some things, but uh, that's that's the basics, and that's kind of what that's what I do for my job is I, I build front end websites like this. Um, I also build backends, which is a whole nother story. That's databases and APIs um, and stuff like that. I'm learning. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> cool. Um, how to break a streamer for sure. I'm gonna see if my overlay will work now. Maybe I, the chat isn't coming in as fast. <laughs> so, let me see. Uh, and by the way, this is the terminal. I look like a look like a hacker. I'm running commands. Um, I'm I'm just gonna run the code that actually starts up my custom overlay. Um, <laughs> thank you, David, for those hundred bits. <laughs> um, npm run electron serve. Yeah. 
Let's see. It's, pro it's probably broken. There's just way too many chats. <laughs> oh, thank you. I, uh, I, I tend to giggle a lot, um, especially in times of stress. I just laugh. <laughs> so that was not that was not intentional. <laughs> Oh, oh, the best time to... So, um, actually, uh, how about this? So, how many of you that came over with Kitboga, how many of you actually can can write code? Uh, or, like, JavaScript coders? This this could potentially scare people away. Like, if you're... Um, uh, if you're totally new to coding, this could, st could, could scare you away. But, oh yeah, type 1 if you know some programming language. And you can, like, solve problems. Yeah, okay, let's try it. Okay, so here's here's another thing that we do on the on the channel here is we play this game called uh, Coding Game, um, where it's like competitive programming. So basically, we're all given a coding challenge at the exact same time, and uh, we will have 15 minutes to uh, to either to solve it to be the fastest one to solve it or potentially uh, solve it in the shortest amount of time. So uh, um, now we're, we're going from complete and total basics to some very advanced stuff. So if, if you know nothing about coding, uh, don't be dissuaded because um, uh, we did some of these this morning and I, I actually only, there was only one that I completed fully. So we'll see, but if you wanna join, um, <laughs> it supports up to 100 viewers. So the first 100 people to click this link, I'm gonna send it a few times because the chat's moving pretty pretty fast. Um, <laughs> so you can uh, you can join us, and um, we're going to compete. Now we don't we don't know what the mode is going to be. Um, it's potentially going to be who can complete it in the fastest amount of time, um, or who can complete it in the shortest number of characters. So you're given a challenge. Um, oh wow, it already started. Oh, <laughs> because it filled up. <laughs> this has never happened. This has never happened. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, no one else can join. But this this one will be fun. So this is shortest mode. Um, so um, we have 15 minutes to solve the problem. So on the left-hand side is the problem description. And then on the right-hand side is where you can write your code. But in, in earlier, I mentioned that there are, there are a lot of programming languages, right? So I use JavaScript, that's my favorite one, but there, there are a ton. So you can choose from any one of these uh, to implement it with, so you can choose that. And then um, uh, in the editor over here, you can see your code size. So did I click start? Oh no, did I? How many people? There's a lot of people. <laughs> I'm sorry. We, we got we to gotta do it. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep going, right? Okay. So um, one thing you need to do in shortest mode is get rid of all the comments. So anything you see, like comment, get rid of that because that's going to be, uh, that's going to count for it. And so if you look at the code size, we want this to be as small as possible. So we're, we're basically code golfing right now. Um, so. Let's figure out what this is asking for. It's probably going to be really hard, but let's see. So for, for a given number of columns, C, and rows, R, uh, print a table with cells uh, numbered from 0 to R times C minus 1. So here's the thing. Uh, as a professional programmer, it is very rare. <laughs> pro professional. <laughs> as somebody who writes code for a living, it's very rare that I actually have to solve problems like this. Th this is like math problems. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll try. <laughs> Thank you for the bits. Thank you very much. Um, so for a given number of columns, C in rows R, print a table with cells numbered from 0 to R times C minus 1. OK, so we're going to be printing a table. I'm going to try. Hey, what's up? Um, you, welcome. <laughs> uh, we got raided by Kip Boga, so there's a bunch of people here. Yeah, math on a Friday. Uh, OK, so numbers must be right aligned within a cell. All cells must have equal width corresponding to the width of the largest number in the table. Yeah, my brain is broke. Um, plus one leading space before the largest number. So for example, 999, the width of one cell would be four characters. Ah, okay. I think I kind of get what it's asking for. So, um, or do I? Excuse me. So in R is the number of rows and C is the number of columns. Okay, so we basically have to count up. <laughs> if you do exclamation mark schedule, you can get a link to um, um, to my schedule. But I will stream tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. GMT minus 6. Uh, and I usually, this is a every other week stream, because usually I'm working on Fridays, but yeah. 
<laughs> I need to rewatch your video. I can't stay behind you. Uh, I have a YouTube channel too, so if you check out my YouTube, all of my streams get uploaded there as well. Thank you all for those follows. I appreciate you. Um, okay. I think what it's asking, so we need two columns. Um, we have two columns and two rows, and then we just start counting up. So um, yeah, so this is nice. You can click here to see what the example test cases are. So three columns, oh no, we have rows then columns, I see. So given the number three and the number four, uh, that means there are gonna be three rows, but four columns. So we have to go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Weird, okay. And um, in this case, there are uh, three columns with 37 rows, so it needs to be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay, so I, I kind of get what this is asking for. Um, yeah, we need loops. Basically, we need loops. Um, yeah, and because this is shortest mode, I'm going to show you like a bunch of weird stuff that we can do in... Um, in uh in javascript yeah we got 107 subscribers today i mean uh 50 of the like 40 ish of those was from john earlier but yeah okay so we need r uh and also because this is shortest mode i'm going to put a lowercase r in a variable for read line and then r is going to be equal to um r invoked so this is the number of rows and then the number of columns equals uh this now um this code is very not very readable <laughs> Thank you, Vape Juice Jordan. Thank you for that sub. Thanks for being here. Uh, if you say hello in the chat, my bot will shout you out, Vape Juice. Just say hi. Just say hi. <laughs> um, cool. But uh, people don't really write their code this way. This is just a... Um, what do you call it? Hi. Oh, hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, you already said hey. Okay, so they might have missed it. <laughs> Check out Vape Juice Jordan. He's a, he's a member of our Live Coder stream. Oh, and I, I totally forgot. So um, all, the, all the Kit Boga friends, thanks for being here. But there are, there are more people like me. <laughs> if you check out the, um, the Live Coders team, uh, this is a team of people that actually code on stream. And a lot of people are, are streamers um, and, and do cool things. So yeah, definitely definitely check that out. And uh, Beep Juice Jordan is one of them. <laughs> All right, um, we're, we're gonna figure this out. Hi, hi, hello. <laughs> All right, we have nine minutes. So we have the number of rows and the number of columns. We need loops. Yeah, somebody mentioned nested, mentioned nested loops. But what I think we're gonna do is um, we need an array that is length columns. So we need we need uh, our, our our arrays that are of length c. <laughs> Nine minutes. I'll figure it out. Uh, no, the the output is not HTML. So in, in this challenge, it's kind of like we're only writing the JavaScript code. We're not doing the CSS and the HTML part. So uh, with columns. Yeah, I guess I'll, I can solve this with for loops easy enough. Um, let's do this. I'm going to I'm gonna write it big, and then we'll try to shorten it at the end, because I'm, I'm feeling the pressure. I'm feeling the pressure. <laughs> so the output is going to be an array. Uh, and then we need a loop that goes uh, from i equal, um, equals 0 up to the number of rows. So while, and let's call this um, row num. Row num. So row num equals zero, while row num is less than r, uh, row num plus plus. So this is going to iterate to get give us the number of uh, rows that we need. Yeah, well, it, we'll, we'll make it smaller later on. I can't like get rid of that. I just want to solve it because I'm, I'm under a lot of pressure. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of people watching. Okay, so we iterate for the number of rows, and then we, we iterate for the number of columns as well. Um, so, do I need pad start? Oh, I guess I will eventually. One cannot eat code. One cannot get sustenance from code. Oh, I didn't show you all this. this oh, <laughs> the job game is broke. <laughs> this, this is my little pixel house. This is where I live. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, so we have a, a loop. It's gonna go for the column number. Um, I, I just killed the drop game. It was a bunch of CPU. So column number starts at zero, and then column number goes up to C. Um, so while column number is less than C, uh, column number plus plus. No pressure. <laughs> All right, so we have this nested loop here. Um, and it, I mean, honestly, we kind of need a counter. Yeah, so um, you have like counter that starts off at zero and then counter just needs to increment on every single time. Um, so we could have like the um, 
the row is an array, and then we're going to push each value from the column or each count counter into there. So we'll say uh, row dot push counter. Well, not that counter plus plus, um, and then we're going to push that row into the output. So we'll say output dot push the row. I think there's one scenario I'm not taking into account, which is like, what if there aren't enough numbers to fill up the columns? We'll look at that next, though. We'll look at that afterwards. Um, cool. And so at the end of all that, um, we're going to have an array of arrays. We're going to need to turn that into like string output. Um, I guess technically, technically, I don't need an array. We could just log as we go. I think we just log as we go. Let's do that. Yeah, so um, let's say, yeah, that's our row. And then right here, instead of pushing it, we'll say uh, print row dot join on spaces like that. Cool. That should do it. All right, let's try it. So we got zero, one, two, three. Um, there's a space in front of it. Why is there a space? So found zero, one, expected zero. Oh, I see. I see. There needs to be space. There needs to be space in front of the, um, the let, let's figure that out. So numbers must be aligned within a cell. Yeah, math for the cell width. Well, so here on the stream, Doc is really, really smart, and he usually tells us how to solve things. So for the sake of time, we only have five minutes. We're going to use Doc's code. Hopefully, you all will forgive me. Um, let's see. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry. <laughs> um, so pad start. So we could do um, each item. We need to pad, it, pad start with the number of rows, which is R, times the number of columns, which is C, divided by 10, floor division, add 1. Really? Really? <laughs> The space, yeah, so the space accounts for double digits, yeah. So if you have a particular column that's going to have, like, 92 in it, um, or, like, let's say 97, and that same column has 100 in it, then it needs to be padded 1 because 100 will need to fit. Look at Terazoid's code. Well, I can't look at the code just yet. All right, all right, all right. Okay, so that's the pad start. But we need to pad each individual element. So I'll, instead of doing row.join, I'm going to say row.map uh, each column and then each column we need to pad start like that and then that whole thing I need to join on spaces like that well that broke <laughs> found okay c dot pad start is not a function um, oh uh, we need this to be a string found zero one expected zero one well well, <laughs> I, can't, I can't do this. I guess we need to figure out, like, what's the maximum possible number? Let's let's see some of these outputs. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we need to we need to figure out. Uh, I can do this. I can do this. I don't need, I don't need Doc's code. <laughs> so what we need is the the maximum possible number. Uh, and yeah, so I think I, I kind of figured out what. Um, uh, what Doc was saying. And thank you, Shine's Love, for that gift sub. So the, the width is going to be um, the number of rows times the number of columns. So basically, we need, like, what is the maximum number that we're going to be outputting? Like, in this case, 110. Um, so 37 times 3 is 111. So just minus 1. Easy. R times C minus 1. That's, uh, that's the, the maximum number. So we then take that maximum number, um, turn it into a string, and get the length of it. <laughs> so that's the width that we need. And so now, um, oh, and then I guess we add one to that. I think we might need to add one to that, because now this width goes right here. Width. Yeah, for some reason, we add one. So length plus one. No! <laughs> oh, oh, I see. And then um, when we join it together, we don't actually include the extra. Yeah, the space, the extra space. Oh, OK. Um, OK, so let's say row is a string like this. And then we, instead of pushing it into the row, we're going to say row plus equal 
this, the counter pad start, because that will take care of our, um, our extra space. So then we print the row like that. All right, I'm being too smart, too smart. <laughs> counter, two string, pad it. All right, will it work? Yes, 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 okay. <laughs> It's working, it's working. <laughs> All right, I have a minute and 30 seconds to make it as small as possible. Um, okay, success. Okay, <laughs> counter, can I rename this just to be lowercase c? Um, did that work? No, that didn't work. All right, I gotta, I gotta be smart about this. So right now my code size is 286. I want it as small as possible. So c, and then now everywhere I use counter, we're gonna do c instead, lowercase c. Um, okay, does it still work? It still works, okay. Uh, I can remove a few characters here and say um, that. Does it still work? It still works, okay. Uh, I can do the same thing here. Um, empty string, like that. How, many, how much do I have? Oh, I only have 42 seconds. We, we, we removed a few characters though. We're down to 257. All right, let's get rid of const. Let's get rid of let. Um, <laughs> delete all the spaces. <laughs> yeah, this one was a hard one for me. Like, I think just even figuring out how to solve it um, took up time. Oh yeah, and I can delete like these spaces and these spaces and these spaces. Unindent. Yeah, I don't have that much time. That we have 14 seconds, 14 seconds. Um, get rid of that. I could technically put it through a minifier. I think that's kind of cheating though. <laughs> Oh no! Okay, I have to be really careful though because when the time is up, I can't change my code anymore. So I have to make sure that it keeps working. Okay, time out. Whew. Whew. All right. <laughs> um, thank you all for bearing with me through that. Um, let's see how we did. Oh wait, there's a ton of people that are way smarter than me. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Everyone. Um. Solid, okay, so it's gonna take a second and then it will update, but you can see these, these are all the other people that participate. I did it, we did it. <laughs> uh, these are all the other people that participated. Um, yeah, so we can see uh, Ezrion did it in 114 characters. Um, Terrazoid in 123. I'm in sixth place, I did 234 characters, yeah. So you, so you saw my process, like I had to solve it first and then I didn't have enough time to make it small. <laughs> playing clash of code might as well be realizing how bad you are at coding yeah uh yeah but yeah let's look at the top one so ezrion let's see how they did it whoa would you look at that <laughs> so uh they have a for loop uh it goes from zero up to the number of rows yeah good game everyone thanks for playing um and then we have um the number of columns that's, it's very, very similar to, this is basically what I did, but in, in many, many less characters. <laughs> um, and let's see Terrazoid. They got it in 123. Oh, 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 buddy. Okay, so read both of them in. We have our outer loop. We have our inner loop. Uh, you're spreading the array into the print call? What is that doing? Yeah, so create an array that is the length of the given column. Um, pad it. I didn't. I did not know that you could do this. You're you're spreading. Wow. Okay. So you're you're spreading arguments in the middle of a function invocation because you have that as your first argument, and then, isn't there like a second argument? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, it's this is um. Uh, argument spreading or, or parameter spreading. If you look on uh, MDN for the spread operator, it basically takes an array, spread syntax. It takes an array of items and spreads it as arguments to a function invocation. Yeah. Oh, okay. Never mind. That's this whole thing here is being spread. Okay, weird. Okay, <laughs> let's look at number three. Kobe. <laughs> uh, shout out to uh, St. Place Things. He's a mod here on the channel uh, and a member of the Life Coders team. Uh, Saint plays things. Did I spell that right? Nope. <laughs> Saint. No, I spelled it wrong. Uh, Saint. Saint plays. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, but check out uh, check out Kobe. Uh, he's a cool dude. He he does clashes on his channel too. Um, all right, he did it. He got third place in 152 characters. Whoa, it's illegible. <laughs> um, oh no, we didn't get hacked. All the all the Kit Boga friends are here. <laughs> uh, they're hanging out with us. Okay, we have a loop up to the number of rows. Our current row starts off as an empty string. Loop up to the number of columns. Um, math log 10 of a times b minus one, and then you floor that. <laughs> is, this, is this how you're figuring out the maximum possible number? <laughs> just, ch just switch chat conk back mode, yeah. Oh, oh, that's true. I totally forgot. Yeah, I, so I built, the, I built that command uh, the shout out command, but I totally forgot. It should work with, um, that, yeah, that, I'm just nervous. <laughs> I'm just nervous. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. Great job, Kobe. Well, let's see if anybody did it in like an interesting, like a, a different language. So all those are JavaScript. We can look at Python, Java. All right. Let's look at Python. So Python is pretty cool. And SPD, SPD, I believe, uh, is a Kitboga friend. They, they originated, they, they, I think they found me through Kitboga. Let's see. So SPD, uh, representing the Boga family um, using Python. So read in <laughs> the number of rows and the number of columns. Yeah, welcome. Check them out. <laughs> um, we then calculate the width. I, you know what? I'm I'm proud of the fact. And thank you very much, Seraphim, for the five gifted subs. I'm proud of the fact that I figured out the width myself. Nobody had to tell me that. I mean, Doc sort of told me that, but I still I still deduce that myself, <laughs> which I'm happy about. Uh, but thank you very much. Um, who was that? Yeah, Sephirim with the gifted subs. I appreciate you. Um, okay, let's look at Python. Python. Okay, get the length. Uh, and then we have a print all on one line. So this is my break timer. If you all have been sitting at, at home for a long time, feel free to stand up, take a stretch, breathe. Okay, um, a lot of times I have to read, um, oh, thank you, Nymphoram, for that hydrate, another hydrate. <laughs> okay, a lot of times I have to read this Python stuff from right to left, but let, let's see. So, yeah, for B in the range, C. So that's the number of columns. Yeah, so for the number of columns. <laughs> it's not Red Bull. This is like a natural energy drink. Uh, we actually have a, we actually have an emote for this. It's the Yerba emote because I drink Yerba all the time. And you can see there's this pixel art, uh, pixel art Yerba. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, for every index in the number of columns, and then for every index in the number of rows, um. Join together a string. Oh, okay, so in JavaScript, we use that function called pad start. In Python, there's a function called write justify, which is pretty cool. So uh, justify that by the given width. Um, and then add a new line if it's the end of the row. Otherwise, add a space. Wow, great job, SVD. <laughs> Uh, can we try the drop game? Yeah, let me see. I might have to refresh the cache of the page. Yeah, because it's, it's frozen. The thing is, um, <laughs> if if everyone in the chat um, tries to do it, it's going to freeze again. Hey, this was not built for thousands of users. This was built for like maybe 100 users. <laughs> That's true. The CSS was performing well. 